as part of my research on the subject for this lecture, I went to the uh, growing facility when the plants were a little bit higher. I wasn't high at the time, but uh, there, are the, there are the plants. Very, very beautifully uh, cultivated, huge amounts of uh, cannabis resin in the female buds. And this is a very uh, carefully controlled scientific process. The plants are, get, are cultivated under optimum light uh, heat conditions. They all come from the same genetic strain, as I've already said. They're all female. And the, the yield of cannabis can be controlled very precisely. I think in this case, around 10% THC plus or minus 0.2% standard error. So this is, this is scientific stuff and the extraction doesn't involve dangerous chemicals and so on. So it's a very, it's an industrial process. And by the way, I don't have any shares in GW Pharmaceuticals, the company doing this, uh, nor am I a consultant to Jeffrey Guy. I simply went there uh, for interest to see what it was like. One question about medical cannabis is how can you deliver this very insoluble uh, material? We're talking about THC, really. And, and smoking turns out to be a very efficient way of delivering a drug of this type, as it is indeed for, for other uh, relatively insoluble compounds such as heroin. If you heat these compounds, heat cannabis in a cigarette, it, uh, it, it, at about 200 degrees it volatilizes, the chemical turns into a vapor, and then it turns into droplets, minute droplet, droplets as a smoke, and the smoke can be inhaled uh, into the lungs by the smoker, and the lungs, as you know, have an enormous surface area absorption uh, field. And this delivers the drug very quickly, as you can see here. The, these are actual, this is how rapidly the plasma concentration goes up on, uh, after beginning smoking. And you can repeat that a second time and get much the same performance uh, a second time around. And you can see it goes up quickly and it lasts uh, a reasonably long time. So this is very effective, and that, that's why in medical uses of marijuana or cannabis, most patients prefer to smoke, as, as they do in America, as I'll show you later. But uh, there, are, there are drawbacks to this. Uh, the cannabis, herbal cannabis smoke contains a whole mixture of chemicals other than uh, THC, of course, and it's, the smoke composition is very similar to that of a tobacco <coughs> cigarette smoke, and indeed even contains some of the same carcinogens that we know are dangerous in uh, tobacco smoke. So far, there's been no evidence to link cannabis smoking with lung cancer, but who knows? It took almost 50 years to work out that relationship between cigarette smoking and lung cancer, and cannabis hasn't been around that long. But so far, no real problems of that sort. Nevertheless, cannabis smokers do develop uh, irritating coughs. They have bronchitis. Uh, they, they tend to have uh, uh, irritated airways. And these are things that might be avoided if you could find another way of delivering the drug. One idea that's been tested and, and looks as if it might be possible is uh, to use a vaporizer, that is a, an instrument that doesn't burn the herbal cannabis but simply heats it up, produces a vapor and a smoke that can be inhaled. But the problem with that is you have to heat it above 200 degrees to get volatile, volatile THC and lots of other plant chemicals will, will come into that smoke as well. However, that may be possible. GW Pharmaceuticals have, been, have uh, used another way of doing this uh, by making a, a, an extract of the herbal uh, cannabis in, in a solvent and then using this type of metered uh, dose spray in, under the tongue into the oral cavity. There's quite rapid absorption. You're not, you're not swallowing, so it's not uh, going through the, the lengthy process of absorption in the, in the gut, it's more rapid. It's not quite as rapid as smoking, but it's a pretty good compromise. Well, if you think about it, if you want to introduce medical cannabis in our hospitals, for example, our hospitals are all now no smoking areas. So you're going to have a smoking room for cannabis use? I, I can't see that. So this would be a more uh, acceptable way and a more precise way of delivering an exact dose. This, each time you push the button here, you get a, 100 microliters and a fixed dose of THC or THC plus cannabidiol, which I haven't mentioned so far, but cannabidiol is one of the relatively inactive, well, it is inactive on the CB1 receptor, but it's a major component of, uh, of the cannabis extract. There's about as much of that in the extract as there is THC. And some people, including uh, Jeffrey Guy, GW Pharma, believe that it has a, a modulating effect on, on the THC uh, pharmacology. 
But uh, that's what it does, and that's what happens in the clinical trials of this product. Patients are given this type of device, and they are asked to self-administer. And the interesting thing is they, the patients find a level of how many puffs they want to have every day, and they avoid intoxicant levels. Most people, most patients with diseases such as MS don't want or are actually frightened by the intoxicant effects, and they will avoid them. So they, each patient tends to titrate to a certain level, and uh, remarkably enough, they stay pretty well stable at that level for days or weeks on end. We're no, we are now in possession for the first time of some proper clinical trial data. You start off with a group of patients you're going to treat. You randomly allocate them to either a treatment group or a control group who receives the same looking tablet or capsule, but doesn't contain any active drug. And these have got to be randomly allocated so the physician can't, uh, can't bias the sampling by looking at from patients that look likely to respond as opposed to those not likely to respond. Then they go into the, uh, the uh, period of uh, treatment. And the treatment has to be done uh, blind, double blind. What that means is neither the patient nor the doctor or the nurse administering the medicine knows whether, the, whether what's being given is the active material or the placebo, the inactive. And that's important too because if the doctor or nurse knew they were giving patients active in, in, uh, drug as opposed to inactive, they might uh, encourage the patients by various body language signs or whatever to, uh, to think they're getting better. So that's the way we do it nowadays. It's the gold standard and at the end of the day we ask the question, uh, what was the outcome? Yes or no, or somewhere in between. And I'll show you in a moment uh, what happens when we do this, uh, when, when, when preparation like Sativax is used in this way for, for example, controlling pain. Pain relief is one of the, the real uh, interesting indications for THC or cannabis. It works in, uh, in various animal models, or especially in animal models where nerve, peripheral nerves are damaged, neuropathic pain pain due to nerve damage. <clears throat> and um, those effects are all blocked by Ramonabant or in a CB1 knockout mice, as I've already said. And there are, there are some interesting interactions with opioid systems, which also, of course, can yield powerful uh, pain-relieving effects. And there appear to be some, although these are distinct mechanisms, there appear to be some synergism so that uh, a small dose of THC will, will help produce a larger response to a given dose of, of morphine and, and vice versa. So what happens in a clinical trial? Well, the, here are some typical results for Sativex, the, the uh, herbal extract given to patients suffering from uh, central neuropathic pain in multiple cirrhosis, a very nasty condition. Multiple cirrhosis, as you probably know, involves damage to the uh, insulating layers of uh, nerve tracts, rend rendering them uh, dysfunctional. And uh, in the peripheral nerves, this can lead to limb spasticity, stiffness, and can lead to, to very difficult to control pain. And when this happens in the brain, in tracts in the brain, there's a central version of this nerve damage pain that's even more difficult to treat. It doesn't respond to morphine, for example. But here's a typical clinical trial using the double-blind placebo control. And isn't it interesting, the placebo group, shown at the top here, actually show quite a significant improvement. And this is quite typical of, of pain trials, quite typical of CNS trials. Patients who received the placebo not knowing whether it was active or inactive are somehow telling their brain systems to generate uh, opioid peptides and get a certain degree of pain relief. At least that's what we think is going on. If we could only uh, p bottle up the neuropathic uh, pain placebo and sell it, it would be a bestseller, but maybe that's called homeopathic medicine. The positive result is the, tr the, the group treated blind with Sativex showed a somewhat bigger pain relief. How do you measure pain? The only way you can measure pain is to ask the patient, how, how are you feeling today? How is your pain? And you usually show them a ruler with a 10 or 11 point scale, 11 point because it goes from naught to uh, 10 and try and put your pencil on uh, where your pain is at today. Is it no pain at all, zero, or is it the worst you've ever had, which would be 10? And these patients start out around seven, and the pain goes down a little bit, 
And the difference, the key for the clinical investigator is, can you show a difference between the placebo dummy and the, and the active drug? And in this case, the answer was yes, although it's a very modest difference, about 1.25 points on an 11-point scale. You might say that's not much. But uh, patients subjectively say that's clinically meaningful. And the regulatory agencies will just about uh, approve that level of uh, pain relief, although it's sort of borderline. Not so, not so borderline, though, that uh, in, in Canada, this type of study was enough to get approval for, Cat for Sativax a few years ago for treating uh, pain in, associated with <coughs> MS, multiple cirrhosis. And this has been on the market in Canada now for some years as a prescription medicine. So this, this is the type of stuff you have to do. You have to do preferably large numbers of patients to get meaningful results. And that's exactly what happened in, in uh, multiple cirrhosis. The MS is one of the real important indications where there are a number of unmet medical needs not treated by modern medicine medicines. Um, and there are, uh, there are a number of animal models that, that try to mimic the uh, demyelination of, uh, associated with human MS. And the animal models do, do exhibit uh, muscle spasm and rigidity and pain. And, and uh, in addition, we have a lot of anecdotal evidence for patients suffering from MS who, uh, who actually illegally use uh, smoke, herbal cannabis. Some of them grow it in their backyard. And the MS Society uh, 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 did a survey of their members some years ago and, and found uh, something like 5% were doing that and, and claiming real benefits. Uh, one particular lobby group lobbied very strongly for uh, medical development of cannabis on the basis of that type of self-reported uh, use, anecdotal. But we know, we, we know as scientists that anecdotal evidence doesn't impress any government regulatory agency. So, you have to do proper trials of the sort I've described. And uh, fortunately, in this area, the Medical Research Council sponsored the first really large-scale trial of cannabis uh, and, and or THC in MS patients uh, with a total number of 630 patients. This was by far the largest clinical trial ever done anywhere in the world for, uh, for, for cannabis or cannabis-related medicine. And I'll show you some of the results. The results were a bit patchy. The, the, there were three groups of roughly 200 patients in each group, a placebo group, uh, one group receiving herbal cannabis extract, and one group receiving pure THC, and all dressed up in, uh, in the identical-looking capsules, so you couldn't tell which was which. And what happened was that the patients reported uh, subjective benefits, maybe I should show you the actual results here, reported uh, some benefits at the end of six months, subjective benefits in both in terms of uh, reduced pain, reduced spasticity of the limbs, and improved sleep, which is also quite important for MS sufferers. But the objective measure done by the clinicians on a so-called Ashworth scale was manipulating the limbs and trying to measure the degree of stiffness on a four-point uh, scale, the so-called Ashworth scale. That is rather a blunt instrument, and it turned out to be very ineffective. You get a wide range of results. The, the horizontal line represents the placebo, and the plus and minus over the placebo is, is all over the place. A large uh, variation in results among patients, even though there are 200 in each group. And there was no effect, statistically, at six months. But lo and behold, at 12 months out here, there was at least one group showing a statistically significant benefit, objectively measured, not asking the patient to self-report. And that, strangely enough, was with the pure THC group, not with the herbal cannabis extract. Those people that believe in herbal medicine were a bit disappointed by this, but pharmacologists may be quite pleased that the answer is so simple. So that's, that really does support the use of uh, THC, at least, in, in um, MS, spasticity, and the Canadian data show also use in treating pain associated with MS.